After three years of the discharge date on the foreclosure, you can use an FHA loan. And I told him, when you buy another property, you're gonna meet a woman. Well, sure <laughs> enough, he did, right? Yep. Because now he's a property owner, he's a, he's a millionaire. Yep. When bonds are doing great, interest rates go up. When bonds are doing poorly, interest rates go down. And that happens uh, every day on the market. All right, guys, we are back. It is Saturday morning. You are listening to K-Talk Radio. This is Yoshi Shiraki, I'm your host. You're listening to the show, Utah, home sweet home. And today, I have a special guest, Marcus Burton. But before we get into Marcus, uh, let me share with you what you're going to be, what we're going to be sharing with you. We're going to be talking about the ins and outs of a real estate transaction from the eyes of a loan officer or mortgage broker. You will, basically a lender. Uh, you will want to listen in because without the loan, you know, there's usually no purchase of a home. Unless, of course, you have a large chunk of cash. Um, we will also be discussing the top questions my guest is asked by his clients. And usually, if it's the top questions he's asked over and over and over, they're probably pretty good questions, so you're going to want to pay attention so you know what to ask when you're chatting with a loan officer or a mortgage broker. Uh, we're also going to discuss a success story on leveraging the bank's money to create your own wealth. So, you know, you always hear OPM, other people's money, leveraging other people's money, in this case, the bank's money, to create your own wealth. And we will be hearing about a nightmare story as well as a success story. I already said the success story, but a nightmare story. Those are always fun to hear, not go through. <laughs> and then um, we'll also be going through the step-by-steps of a, obtaining a loan. So if you've never obtained a loan before, uh, we're gonna, Marcus is going to share with us the typical steps so that you have an idea of what to expect when you go through that. And then we're also going to spend some time talking about refinancing and home equity line of credits, when it might make sense, when it might not make sense to do that. So, without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about Marcus. Marcus, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. You've got a ton of wisdom. I'm excited for the listeners to hear all about it. So. Marcus was born and raised in San Francisco, California, uh, married his very best friend. They have three wonderful daughters. He's been self-employed for over the last 25 years. He's an owner of a private fitness, uh, owner of a private fitness training studio, co-owner of a small national telecommunications company, dabbled in real estate since the early 90s. Muhammad, were you even born in the 90s? Okay, Mohammed's very young here, so just want to make sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> moved to Pleasant Grove, Utah in 2003, where I decided, where he decided to branch out in real estate and purchase investment properties, flip homes, and end up becoming a loan officer because of the business that was coming his way. And he's been doing loans ever since 2003 and loves what he does. And that's actually why I brought him in, because I, after getting to know Marcus, I could see that he loves what he does versus doing it because he needs a living. When you find people passionate about what they do, they seem to just be better at it because they love it. So, Marcus, if I may, um, I'd love to ask you what the top three questions are that you get asked as a mortgage broker, loan officer. What, 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 um, what, what, what should I call you? Mortgage broker, loan officer? What do you I'm prefer? A, I'm a broker. broker. Mortgage broker. Okay, perfect. So what are the top three questions you get asked? So I would say the biggest question that I get asked all the time from every prospective borrower or client that I talk to is, what are interest rates? Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates, I generally quote them between three and nine. And I do that on purpose because interest rates are varied. It depends on um, your loan to value. It depends on if it's an investment property, if it's a second home. It depends on your debt to income. The biggest contributor, it depends on your FICO score. They're FICO driven. So I get asked that question a, a lot, and I think it gives me an opportunity to really teach people um, what interest rates really are to their specific need, and not just a general, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a real estate agent, my clients ask me that all the time, and usually I refer them to you or whoever they're working with as their lender, just because everybody's scenario is different. It is different. And you know, a lot of times I'll have people call me and they'll go, hey, what are interest rates today? And I tell them that interest, whatever that interest rate is that day, I, I like to quote them live interest rates. And they say, well, wait a minute, my buddy just got, you know, maybe it's a half point less. And I mm -hmm. said, well, when did he buy? And they'll tell me, well, he bought about uh, six months ago. And I says, well, unfortunately, interest rates go up and down 
Um, investors rule that when they're on, on the market, the bonds go up and down. When bonds are doing great, interest rates go up. When bonds are doing poorly, interest rates go down. And that happens uh, every day on the market. So they're dictated interest rates. Sometimes I've seen them change three times in a day. Uh, the story of my world, uh, trying to quote people and get them. Uh, so I try to educate people as, as good as I can uh, on what they can expect uh, with interest rates. Very cool, very cool. What would you say the second question is? Probably the second question is having to do with uh, credit score. Um, a lot of people out there, it's a misconception that, that everybody thinks, uh, when I ask somebody, when I say, what do you think the waiting period is behind a foreclosure or behind a bankruptcy uh, before you can buy a home? And the, the standard answer is seven years. Uh. So seven years is correct, however, the seven years is the time that it takes to fall off of your credit. Sometimes it takes 10 years. Mm. But with an FHA government loan, um, you can basically go out and within two years after the discharge date of the bankruptcy, you can purchase a home. After three years of the discharge date on the foreclosure, you can use an FHA loan. And I want to kind of talk about that just a little please, bit because please. I have a lot of clients that come and they'll say, uh, and I'll just quote one client that this happened to recently. Um, she went out and she basically said, it's been three years since my foreclosure, I wanna buy a home. It was actually four years. And to me, I said, this is great, it's been four years. But I specifically asked her, well, it might have been th four years since the foreclosure date, but we need to look at title. We need to find out when it actually left um, the name of the, the bank, when it was actually sold. So anyway, come to find out, uh, we went in, we looked at it, and the bank held the property, even though it went into foreclosure, they held the property for two years. Oh, wow. So therefore, she's not four years anymore, she's only two years. So she has to wait one more year to qualify. There's always that sticking point, and a lot of times I will end up, and I was gonna talk about this later anyway, yeah. but a lot of times I'll end up with people who come back and say, hey, I had a lender who couldn't pre-qualify me and I had a foreclosure, and the first question I ask them is what was the discharge date and more importantly let's do a search and find out when it actually the title changed to when it was out of their name and that's when the three-year period starts with FHA. Got it, got it. Okay, very interesting. So you're so basically the bank will can hold on to these foreclosures for as long as they want. They can hold on for as long as they want. They can hold on for as long as they want. And a lot of times what they'll even do, and this is something that, you know, in this industry you learn every day, just like in real estate, right, Yoshi? Right, right. So what I learned recently is there's, uh, even though the bank has sold it, sometimes uh, FHA in particular, um, they have a report called the Cavers Report, and that's just a report on um, keeping track of that borrower if they, uh, for instance, if even if the discharge date was three years ago, maybe they didn't release the mortgage insurance or didn't pay that off until later on. So the three years starts after that. So there are steps that you have to go through. This, uh, this client of mine actually went through the process of calling FHA, uh, talking to FHA, and even though she had about six or eight months to wait uh, before she could actually purchase, she actually made a request to call what suppressed the mortgage insurance. Hmm. She got it suppressed, she won, um, and so we're going to be out looking for a home for her this week. Oh, that's fantastic. It's awesome. Yeah. That is good For news. her. I'm happy for her. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, then, now what's the third uh, best, uh, most common question you're asked? Uh, great question. <clears throat> uh, third question is, why do I need a pre-approval? Oh, um, yeah. So I'm, listen, I think, I think the industry has it wrong. You're, you're a real estate agent, and I work with tons of real estate agents, but the minute somebody wants to buy a home, uh, let me ask you, yeah. who do they go to? Uh, usually a real estate agent. Usually a real estate agent. And what does that real estate agent tell them? Uh, you should get pre-qualified. You should get pre-qualified, right? <laughs> yes. So I try to educate people on pre-qualification. It's like when you're pre-qualified, you're, I'm pulling your credit. Um, I am looking at your income documentation, maybe pulling tax records if you're self-employed. I am doing my diligence to make sure that you are a qualified borrower. Uh, that makes a huge difference in pre-qualification because that shows the seller um, that you are an able buyer. It kind of lets you know what area you can buy in. So you're not going to look at a $500,000 home. That's the one your wife wants. Then you realize you can only qualify for 350. Nothing is gonna look that good anymore. Right. So pre-qualification to me is so, so important uh, to get done because it just gives you the power to know where you are and what you can do. Wonderful. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and as a real estate agent, I would say the more stronger that pre-qualification is, 
the more stronger your offer will be when you go to submit the offer to a seller. Absolutely. It makes all the difference in the world. Yep. So versus uh, somebody who has no pre-qualification, the seller might like your offer as far as the number you've presented. However, they don't know if you can actually buy the home, so they might not pick your offer. Correct. And go with a less stronger offer on someone who's showing, I can actually afford your house. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. So a question I get asked by um, my clients a lot is, hey, Yoshi went through the process of getting pre-qualified, and the individual informed me I didn't qualify for a loan at this particular bank, at this particular lender. Should I give up the hopes, uh, you know, give up on, on searching for another house, or should I go try and get pre-qualified with another lender? Is there any hope at all? What, what's your answer to that? So I have a very simple answer to that. No. <laughs> no. Don't ever give up, right? Right. Um, I have, uh, that's where this success story comes in. Uh, I have a listing agent uh, that was selling a home, um, and she had a buyer's agent come in with a buyer, and basically the buyer was qualified. He had a pre-qualification letter that we just spoke about. Yep. Uh, three days before the settlement deadline, the lender called him up and said, you do not qualify, the loan is dead. Oh. So the listing agent who knows me yeah. said to the buyer's agent, you have to get your client in touch with Marcus. Marcus will take a look at it. So I grabbed the borrower, uh, ran the numbers, took it to an underwriter, ran it through what's called DU or direct underwrite with Fannie Mae. Okay. I got an approved eligible. We closed that gentleman in eight days. Wow. So I, I'm just telling you, in the, in the course of doing loans for almost 16 years, I've had so many clients who have had a pre-approval, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not worth the letter that it was written on. Uh, and they've come to me, and I've saved the day a lot of times because I just asked the right questions, I guess. There are a lot of good lenders out there, but there are a lot of lenders probably out there that need to do a little better on what they do and asking and digging that client and really finding out what's going on. Very cool. Got it. If you don't mind me asking, actually, that brings up a good point. Um, I was chatting with a bunch of friends. I belong to a real estate mastermind, and uh, we meet once a month, and I was chatting with some friends, and uh, there seemed to have been a particular bank, I won't uh, state the bank, <laughs> a larger bank, um, and uh, this particular bank, for whatever reason, was giving out pre-qualified pre pre letters um, to, and, and through the experience of the gentleman in the mastermind, a lot of his experience that when it was time to actually go towards the financing part and making sure that would happen, the buyer really didn't qualify. However, you know, just in our mastermind, there were several stories, several of us that had gone through where we were representing a seller, buyer was pre-qualified by this particular bank, it didn't happen, then we had to start all over. You know, as a seller, that buyer had to start over. We just had to decide if we wanted to wait for them to start over or just cancel the contract and, and put it back on the market. And this particular bank came up several times. Um, what is the process that, you know, let's say general process and then maybe the difference, I don't know if you could share what makes a pre-approval stronger versus what you said before, not even worth the paper it's written on. What's the general process of it and what should people be looking for to go, this is a stronger pre-approval letter, if, if, if there is anything to look at. So that's a great question, and I would always, always, always 100% refer back to the loan officer. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of good loan officers out there. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of loan officers who maybe work for a big bank um, and uh, make a little less money, let's say, yeah. uh, working for a bank, and I don't think that the underwriting or the pre-underwriting standards uh, at a bank at the loan officer level when you walk into a bank um, is at the level of which uh, someone like me who's a broker, mm -hmm. um, I, I, my whole reputation is based on making something happen and making that client happy so they're going to tell somebody about it. I don't have, I can't hide behind a big bank. Right. Um, so I think the pre-qualification letter is going to come down to your loan officer and what he knows and if he knows his stuff and if he's got connections uh, with underwriters or whoever he can sit down to mm -hmm. or with uh, to get that pre-approval or that pre-qualification uh, done and it, it's worth the paper that it's written on. Now, having said that, I will tell you that sometimes you will write a pre-qualification letter and something comes up at the very end or something comes sure. up that nobody was anticipating. Yep. That's where a good loan officer comes in and says, I'm going to make this happen. And there's one thing that I've always said to the real estate agents that I work with, Unless I tell the borrower about the problem, it's never a problem. This Got is it. why I have gray hair. Uh, <laughs> this is why I have problems in life. I'm stressed all the time. Because it, you're a fixer of problems. And yeah. even the, the best plans made that you can do a pre-approval on, if something comes up, 
Um, heck, it's your job to get that taken care of. It's not your job to tell the client. Right. After closing, if you want to share it with the client and say, gosh, this was close to dropping just as a fun point, yeah. um, that's up to you. But I, I always come back to the loan officer. I think it has to do with the moxie and the knowledge of the loan officer. Awesome. You know, that's, that's funny you said that. I saw a, a quote that a buddy of mine put on Facebook. Um, real estate agents, uh, uh, definition of real estate agent, a problem solver, but that would be the same for you as well, a mortgage broker. Exact same. Constantly solving problems. Awesome, excellent. Well, we are going to go to a commercial break right now, but uh, you're definitely going to want to stay tuned because Marcus has a really cool success story on leveraging the bank's money to build your own wealth. All right, Mohammed, please take us to commercial. Is this off? With smartphones and technology making life a little easier, the Snap Leash has also been designed to make life a little easier for you and your pup. Whether you're out on a stroll in the park or possibly a walk through the city or maybe even a hike up in the mountains, the Snap Leash is the perfect leash for you. The Snap Leash can easily and conveniently convert it to seven leashes, making the Snap Leash the most convenient leash in the world. What other leash do you know that is seven leashes in one? With the Snap Leash having appearances on the Today Show in New York City, TV4 in Dallas, Texas, and ABC4 on Midday Utah, you are definitely going to want to take a peek at what the Snap Leash can do for you and your best friend. Make life a little easier for you and your pup and visit www.snapleash.com today. All right, we are back. You guys are listening to K Talk Radio. We have Marcus Burton. It is our guest today. I'm Yoshi Shiraki. You're listening to the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. Today we're talking about the transaction of a real, the, basically the eyes of a trans, the, the step-by-step -step of a transaction through the eyes of a mortgage broker. And that's important because without the loan, you're probably not going to be able to buy the house unless you have a large chunk of cash, of course. So Marcus has shared with me before a really cool success story on an individual, a client that he works with that basically was able to leverage the bank's money to create wealth for him. Marcus, do you mind sharing the step by step? You, you told it to me in a step by step format, which I think was very powerful. I think the listeners would benefit from that. Do you mind sharing that with us, please? I love sharing the story and I tell it to a lot of people and I, I, I don't know if I'm trying to talk them into building wealth, wealth right away when I meet with them. Some people don't want to do this, they just want to buy a house. Uh, but this gentleman actually put an ad in the paper, I'm going to call him D-Man. Okay, so like D-Man. D-Man put an ad in the paper looking for investors to help him get to know real estate. Well, through connecting through that ad, um, he and I and another gentleman that was a real estate agent, uh, we were able to help D-Man um, with no money down uh, buy a multifamily unit. He was smart. He got into that multifamily unit. Now, remember, this was pre-meltdown. So sure. this was pre-2008. Yeah. So he got into that um, with zero money down. So he did a first and a second. Because it's a primary residence, mm -hmm. you can buy an investment property as a primary residence if you're going to live in one of the units. Most people don't know that. Um, that's my job to inform them, right? Yep. Um, so he bought a fourplex, and he lived in the first unit. And as tenants moved out, he would just move into the next units and fix those up and raise the rents. About a year and a half later, a couple of years later, he called me up and he says, Marcus, I'm ready to, to buy a, a, a triplex. So I said, okay, D-Man, let's go. Same thing, no money down. We got in, uh, we got into the triplex and he started doing the same thing. And I told him, when you buy another property, you're going to meet a woman. Well, sure <laughs> enough, he did, right? Because yep. now he's a property owner. He's a, he's a millionaire. Yep. And uh, so he met um, her sweet lady, um, went to their wedding. Uh, not she long ago. She's D-woman? She's D-woman. Okay. We call her S-woman. Okay. S-woman. Yeah, D-man and S-woman. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I went to the wedding and after that they bought a home in West Valley. Uh, he continued the trend where he was now living in West Valley. He owned a fourplex, a triplex, and he owned three homes. And I believe his total out of pocket at this point was $500 a month. Wow. So he's got three homes and he owns and he's using other people to pay those mortgages. That's fantastic. And he, he rented the basement in the West Valley home, correct? I believe he did. I okay. believe he did to one of his, his family. He's got a great family and yeah. they, they understand that. Um, so a few years later, he called me up again. He says, I'm moving to South Jordan. I'm buying a bigger home. And so I helped him buy that home. Um, he's been a loyal client and a loyal friend. Um, after he bought that home, he kind of sat on things a little bit. I believe he was maybe out of pocket a few hundred dollars more a month. 
Um, and about, gosh, it was about a year and a half ago, he called me up again. He said, Marcus, he goes, I'm buying a home in Bluffdale. I sold the fourplex. I sold the home in West Valley. I've got a huge down payment, which grew for him because other people are paying for his, his property and his yeah. equity has grown. Anyway, he bought a million dollar home in Bluffdale, put a large amount uh, down. Um, and he's smart. He's he's turning the the basement into a rental. Wow. Um, he's got a shop that has a unit above it. He's going to finish that. But I would venture to say he still owns the fourplex. He still owns the um, I think one of the homes that he owns. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his I don't know what his out of pocket is, but it's minimal. Um, but he used the power of other people's money uh, to invest in real estate with nothing down in yeah. the beginning. And now he's got this empire. He's even started a welding company. He's got he's on track to close a million dollars in his first year. Um, he is an inspiration, and I look at him and I try to tell everybody about him. Yeah. And I refer to him to everyone as D-Man. So I, I I like sharing his story. That's an awesome story. So Marcus, in what time frame did this all happen, approximately? Within a decade. It Ten, all years. Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Do you mind sharing approximately what his large down payment was, so the v listeners can get an idea of? You know, he bought a million dollar home, but his mortgage payment was only, his loan was only a certain amount because he brought a certain amount. Do you mind sharing approximately what that amount was? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, without going into detail, I think, that, <coughs> I think that the sale of the two homes and his equity, that he probably put down four or $500,000. Wonderful. And the reason I ask that is how, how likely is it that most listeners out there going to their nine to five or wherever they work in a 10 year period can save five hundred thousand dollars to put down on a million dollar home not likely it's hard not to, likely. it's hard to save five hundred thousand dollars it is in that short of a span it is so by power by 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 leveraging other people's money by getting a loan to purchase real estate by leveraging other people's money and that they're giving you rental income to pay down that mortgage for you by leveraging the you know appreciating market that we've experienced over the last ten years ish, um, he was able to buy a million dollar home in that short of a period, which is really miraculous. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I told him at one point. I said every Christmas you should send them a, a nice little gift and say thank you for building my wealth. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which is you know one of the things that when I'm chatting with friends who want to get started in real estate and they're you know they're asked asking me, you know, what's the best way to start? It's really just start. Correct. You know, I mean, just start, a, just start, just start, just buy something. Market will go up. Even if you did it wrong, yeah, it might not be the best way. You know, there's obviously better ways than others, but if you just at least started, and that's the beautiful thing about so many people I know who built their wealth on real estate is they didn't know what they were doing. They just started, <clears throat> you know, they read a book maybe, or they, uh, you know, heard through a friend that you should buy rentals. And so they did, and they bought a piece of property. Uh, as an investment property, and uh, somebody else paid their mortgage for them, you know, or most of it, if not all of it, sometimes there's even cash flow at the end. God bless America. God bless America, <laughs> you know? And uh, somebody is paying for a house for them mm -hmm. to own it, and that's building their wealth, and then, you know, after you add on the appreciation over 10 years in a good market like we've experienced, then you can turn around and sell that and have a nice chunk of change to buy your dream home or put whatever. Put yourself in an amazing position that you could have never done without that. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's great, you know, and I love success stories, but every time there's a success story, you hear of a nightmare story. Yes, you do. And um, nightmare stories are kind of fun to hear when you're not the one in the story, but the reason why I like to ask every uh, all of my guests about a nightmare story is because there's a lesson to be learned, and if our listeners can learn from someone else's nightmare, then that's a huge benefit. You know, I've, I've experienced, as a home flipper, I've had some projects that uh, did not go the way I was hoping, and they were a nightmare. And if people can learn from that, and it saves them a large chunk of change that I had to experience, I think there's value in that. So, if you don't mind, tell us about a nightmare story. No, absolutely. And this, this happened to me. I mean, I was a loan officer uh, for 16 years, and this was a couple, three years into it. And uh, we had a, a gentleman and his wife, they qualified for a loan. Um, they were about two days away from closing. And every lender, I don't know that everybody knows this, but every lender, uh, even though you're qualified, even though you've got clear to close and you're signed your documents, when those documents are signed and they go back to the lender for final review before they hit that fund button, 
they're going to check your credit one more time to see if there's any inquiries, to see if you've gone out and done anything that you shouldn't have done. They're going to call your job just to, hey, is he still there or is she still there? Mm -hmm. And so two days before closing, the docs were back. They were going to fund, uh, and they called, and there was an inquiry on the credit. And so they dug a little deeper. I called the borrower, and I said, hey, there was an inquiry. And they said, they said now remember, their debt to income was close enough already. Okay. They couldn't add another bill. Sure. So anyway, we were so excited about having a new house, so we wanted to get a new car to park in the garage, and we bought a new Mercedes with a thousand dollar payment. Oh, no. And I said, "Oh my gosh, um, you need to take that car back. It's going to put you over, and you're going to you're going to get this loan denied." Um, they couldn't take it back. The loan was denied, um, and gosh, they were so upset, and understandably. Yeah. Uh, but as a loan officer, you try to go through uh, the first time when you talk to people, and this is one of the things that I say over and over and over again, don't do anything after we've pulled your credit. Don't go out and buy anything. Don't do anything. I even pet people sometimes even call me and go, hey, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to, I'm using my credit card and I'm going to go to Home Depot and put $150 on it. And I go, you're good. That's not what I'm talking about, but yeah. thank you for calling. Yeah. Um, go get an ice cream after you're good. Uh, <laughs> but I want people to know that when you're in a transaction with hundreds of thousands of dollars that a lender is going to give you, they don't want you to have anything that's going to mess that up, that's going to encumber upon that. Sure. And so I try to coach people from the very beginning and not to do anything, but that's a nightmare story that's never happened again, but I've heard it happen again to other uh, loan officers in the industry. Uh, same with me. I've heard it happen to uh, uh, different acquaintances. Um, <clears throat> another situation that uh, an acquaintance shared with me is their client went, they were so excited to buy a home, uh, who can blame you? Uh, they went to RC Willie, opened up a new RC Willie card, bought a ton of furniture, and that ruined their debt to income ratio. And so uh, they had a lot of cool furniture, but they did not have a house anymore. Absolutely. Do it the day after you close, yes. after it's done. <laughs> right, right. If you're going to go buy furniture, wait till after. You know, I I'll usually have a conversation with a lot of my clients after they've been pre-approved and just, I know a lot of the people I work with, uh, loan officers, mortgage brokers, will educate the client in exactly what you just shared. Don't go, you know, ruin your debt to come ratio. But I like to have that second conversation with them just to reinforce it. Just to reinforce uh, it never hurts to hear it more than one time. Multiple times. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I, I, I remember working with a client once and he shared with me that, uh, you know, they were gonna go furniture, furniture shopping, ironically. Um, and shared that RC Willie story with him, and, and uh, he's like, "Good to know." He's like, "I don't know when we were going. I don't, you know, we hadn't said we were going before, or after." I said, "Well, great, just wait till after." <laughs> so, and I, you know, he may have been able to qualify for furniture and a house. I don't know, but it was just better to wait for after. So, Always better. Yeah. So, if you're under contract, or if you've just been pre-qualified, and you're looking to purchase a home, don't go leverage more credit in the meantime. So, good words of advice, a good experience to learn from from someone else's nightmare for the listeners here. Um, all right, well, it's time for another commercial break, but when we get back, we're gonna go through the step-by-steps on obtaining a loan. A lot of people wonder why there's so many things that have to be handed in to the loan office, the mortgage broker. Um, I have clients tell me, I honestly hear from the mortgage broker every day asking for something new. What is what? What are they doing? So stay tuned, when we get back, Marcus is gonna share all about the step-by-steps. Mohammed, take us to commercial, please. Hi, I'm Yoshi Shiraki, the author of the book, My Body's Just For Me, the book written for children to educate children on the prevention of child abuse. With the assistance of multiple best-selling author, Richard Paul Evans, we were able to publish this book as a tool to help break the ice in an easy and innocent way to help children understand and learn how to speak up and communicate. I've been invited numerous times onto Good Things Utah to discuss the importance of good communication with your child in regards to abuse, and also to discuss how the book, My Body's Just For Me, is a great tool for every parent when having that tricky conversation with their children. For more information on the book, My Body's Just For Me, please visit www.protectourangels.com today. And remember, the more we focus on prevention, the less we will have to focus on rehabilitation. All right, we are back from commercial break. This is Yoshi Shiraki. I'm your host of the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. We're on K-Top Radio, 
and we've got Marcus Burton, a mortgage broker, as our guest today. And Marcus has uh, been sharing a lot of great wisdom. If you've uh, missed the show up until this point, uh, don't worry. This is recorded in a podcast format. We'll also have videos for you to check out on our social media platforms because there has been some great information Marcus has already shared. And um, what we're going to go through now is the step-by-steps on obtaining a loan. I have clients that tell me all the time, Yoshi, I, I hear from the mortgage broker every single day. He's calling me every day asking me for this, asking me for that. How many steps are there necessary to obtain a loan? And so, Marcus, if you don't mind sharing with the listeners, what does it take to uh, have somebody qualify for to, to obtain a loan? So this is probably the most exciting part of the program. You're sitting at the edge of your chair. You're drooling because you're tired. You've, you've been through this whole interview process so far. So... Um, as far as getting a loan goes, um, here's the easiest way that I sum this up to my clients. Uh, first of all, one of the things that I do um, as a loan officer, and I work with a great team. I have a great team, a processor, a setup person. Um, we try to make sure that from the very beginning, when we're writing that pre-approval letter, not only am I gathering your income documentation, pulling your credit, but I am digging. I'm asking you questions. Um, about everything because I want to make sure that I get as much documentation the first time around so I'm not calling you back over and over and over again to ask you for additional documentation. A lot of times that seems like overkill but I tell you at the beginning I want you to look at this like and this is my analogy that I use. I want you to look at this as the lender uh, and the underwriter are a judge and I'm your lawyer so I need as much of information from you as possible because I want to present the best case possible so they look at it and go, no problem, approved. There are a lot of times, sorry? I, I love it, yeah. There are a lot of times when I will put together, and this has to do a lot with the processor. I've got to, got to give processors the, a, a, a kudos on the back end um, because they're the ones actually looking at the file most of the time. I do my best to provide, um, but at the end of the day, the processor is, is the one who makes it. There's a lot of times um, where I'll even get conditions back from the lender where there are no conditions. And that tells me that I've supplied enough to satisfy their requirements and I'm not calling the borrower back at all. And I think 30% of the time that's the case. Um, probably another 40% of the time there's one or two. Um, I've seen deals um, where it's not prepared, not me, but where it's not prepared correctly when the conditions come back and it's two pages of conditions. Hmm. Um, I think, that, again, it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, that has everything to do with the caliber of the loan officer and liking what they do and asking the right questions and digging. And I think after doing this for 16 years, you kind of get to know if somebody starts talking about something, you kind of know what to ask for. You kind of know to take that avenue and what to ask for sure. um, so this doesn't happen at the end. But um, there you go as far as that goes. Got it. Okay. So <clears throat> the step-by-step, step, though, first person, so, so someone will call you, right? Uh, let's say I refer, Marcus, I'm going to send a client your way. Uh, can you help them get pre-qualified? And I want to know that when I take these people shopping, they're going to be able to get a loan. Will you walk through Absolutely. the first step that happens when these people reach out to you? Absolutely. So the first step is I get <clears throat> them uh, either online with me or I send them a link. They fill out an application. Uh, on that application, they can download documents to a secure website. Um, once I get that, a lot of times this is on them, right? Okay. I send it out and two days later I don't see anything, so I'll call them up and go, hey, you want to buy a house? And sometimes it's, it's an emergency. We've got to get them pre-qualified within a couple of hours. Uh, but once they fill out the application and provide me the documentation, um, I will pull their credit. I will verify things. Um, I will sit down and, and have a discussion with the processor, the setup person, um, after all the documents are there, and we will decide which way to go forward, which is best, what other documents we need, if any. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I issue a pre-approval letter. Um, they go out, they'll find a house, and this isn't a purchase transaction, sure, obviously. Sure. Uh, it's about the same with a the refinance. They'll go out, they'll put an offer in a house. Once the offer is accepted, uh, the offer comes back in. Um, we disclose on the property now. We send out disclosures mm -hmm. uh, that they sign. It's just electronic. Um, once those disclosures are signed, that's when the ball starts rolling. It's kind of an engagement letter, right? Right. I can, or, I can order the appraisal. I can order tax transcripts. Isn't this exciting stuff? Isn't yeah. Isn't this just yeah. so exciting? It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I order well, how tax... How am I wake up? 
<laughs> Sorry to bother my boy. I'm just kidding. So I'm just kidding. He's away. <laughs> He's taking notes. <laughs> I order tax transcripts. We get the ball rolling. Um, it, we wait generally, uh, I don't know, three or four days until we get everything back. Sometimes the appraisal, because we're in a market with such low interest rates right now, appraisals are taking sometimes seven days to get back. Um, we can always, you know, we can always speed that up. Uh, mm -hmm. We can order a rush on it. We can do that. But generally, uh, once the appraisal comes back, the amazing processor will put everything together. They will submit it to the lender for the first portion of getting it approved, a conditional approval. Even though we might have a DU approval that, we've, that we shot in the beginning as far as the approval goes, the pre-approval, um, you always submit it to the underwriter. They're the ones who button it up and sew it and make it a nice little package. Um, once they do the, the conditional approval, they'll send it back, whether there's any conditions or not. That generally takes a day or two to clear up. Mm -hmm. um, once they do that, we resubmit it over to there, and we look for that golden, those three golden letters, right? Yeah. CTC, clear to close. Nice. Once we get that clear to close, that's when we're almost there. We're so close, and once we get that clear to close, um, we send out what's called the CD or the closing disclosure okay. to the borrower. Okay. The borrower, as of one day is not enough, the borrower gets three days at, to boring ad nauseum to read over the disclosure, <laughs> all the cost, everything that's happening uh, before the closing. After the third day of the closing disclosure, the, uh, the closing is generally scheduled when the CD goes out, uh, so they have three days. So on the fourth day we're sitting, uh, we're signing at the title company. Okay. If it's early enough in the morning, documents will go back to the lender. Um, and sometimes wet funding happens. That's where they fund it on the same day that they sign. But it has to happen early in the morning. Got it. As a general rule of thumb, anytime something is, uh, the documents are signed after 1 p.m. in the afternoon, you can guarantee that it's not going to fund until the next day. And remember, before it funds, they're going to check one more time to make sure that you haven't bought a Mercedes and you haven't right. quit your job, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> that process uh, for a good, um, even in the broker world in the busy time, that process can take anywhere between 18 to 25 days Got it. Uh, to get that done. <clears throat> can we speed things up if somebody's looking to get sped up? Absolutely. There's things that we can do. Got it. Got it. That's a good question. I, I'm going to, or that's a good point. I want to ask about what can you do. But before I do that, um, when uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. When you say that you ask for documents, what kind of documents are you asking for? This is like the very beginning. You're meeting with them and, and you shared that you can ask them for documents and then uh, submit those to underwriting. And if all goes well, you won't be asking for more documents. What are these documents? Uh, so, you know, generally the basic documents are W-2s for two years, 60 days of bank statements, 30 days of pay stubs if you're w 2 if you're self-employed. If you have K-1s, we're going to ask for your personal taxes, your business taxes, K-1s, anything that's going to help show us the last two years of income, right, that right. you do. Um, a driver's license, so if you tell us that you're John Smith, that we can verify you're John Smith, um, things like that. Um, if there's a real estate purchase contract or a Rep C, we ask for a fully executed uh, version of the Rep C. Um, and uh, homeowner's insurance, if you're going to order homeowner's insurance, you have to have homeowner's insurance, right? Yep. Um, things like that. So everything that has to do with the house we're asking for, if you've been divorced, yep. if you tell me that, then I'm going to say I need the divorce decree. If you're paying child support or alimony or you're receiving child support or alimony, then I have to ask for birth certificates uh, to verify the age of the children and look at the divorce decree to make sure that they're not 15 years or older because that only that only applies for the next three years if you're receiving child support ah, um, and so you've got it that's part of their income though right right um, so there's documents that w and that's what I say you dig and you ask specific things based on but generally it's going to be the income documents uh, bank statements driver's license uh, things like that got it okay cool good to know um, the next question that I wanted to share, you know, in the contract, in the REPSI, uh, granted you go just by the standard Utah State approved REPSI, there is a 14 day due diligence period and then if that buyer decides to move forward, then typically we'll notify the loan officer mortgage broker, hey they're moving forward, at which point the appraisal gets ordered at that time. No point in ordering it before if they're going to cancel because nobody wants to pay for an appraisal on the house they're not going to buy. What's typically happening those first 14 days um, that you guys are doing? And, and if you don't mind, it's kind of a two-point question. You, you shared uh, 
you work with a processor, and then there's an underwriter, and then there's you, of course. I know I've recommended clients to mortgage brokers, loan officers, and uh, they'll tell me, hey, listen, you recommended me to Joe, but I ended up speaking to Mary. Uh, did I call the right person? And Mary happens to be the processor. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what you're doing those first 14 days, or your team, the processor, underwriter, um, while we're waiting for the due diligence to end, and uh, what is each person's role so that the listeners kind of have an idea, oh, that's why I talked to Mary and not Joe when I talked to Mary. So during that 14 days, and generally most people don't wait the 14 days, they're moving forward, right? Sure. Um, but during that 14 days, we are doing everything we possibly can within reason to get everything ready uh, because most transactions take an average of 30 days. Sometimes they take longer depending on circumstances, but we're doing everything on our end to get that uh, file ready so mm -hmm. when the appraisal is ordered and comes in we go right into underwriting and, it, and that's that's where it takes the least amount of time because it comes back out of underwriting clear to close conditions uh, and, and we go the role of everybody in the in the deal um, I'm one of those loan officers that likes to be involved okay. um, there are a lot of loan officers uh, just like real estate agents out there mm -hmm. where they've got transaction coordinators or a processor in my case um, where they hand the file off um, and they say, hey, that, that's their job where they're going to contact, but I still like to know what's going on. The worst thing that anybody can do, whether you're a real estate agent or in business or a loan officer, is if somebody, client calls you and says, hey, what's going on with this file? And you go, uh, let me call my processor. So sure. I think it's imperative that you are always in touch with what's going on. But I always try to educate my borrower in the very beginning. I think expectations are everything. Mm -hmm. And I think if you educate your borrower in the very beginning and say, it's not just Marcus Burton, it's Marcus Burton and my team. Sure. Um, I've got um, <clears throat> this gentleman who's going to be contacting you to make sure you're following up and putting your documents in or getting the documents in. This person, the processor, is going to be following up with you to add things of this, but they're working with me but you always have permission um, to call me. I'm always ready to help you, and I know exactly what's going on with the loan at all times. So they're more of a help than they are a hindrance. Trust me, without processors and people who do set up on file, um, it would be a long, laborious job, for sure. Absolutely, you know, and I always feel, whether it's you know, a, a sports, a sports athletic event, <clears throat> or business, teams typically in general produce better than individuals. Absolutely. Yeah, more people can get more done than one Correct. person. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a knock on anyone who's doing it by themselves. I did it by myself for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> <laughs> and realized when I built a team, I could get more done, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I love working with teams. I love people that work with teams. Uh, it's just fun for people to hear what, you know, the center of a basketball team versus the point guard versus uh, forward versus the shooting guard. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will be like, I speak to all these people at the at the loan officers or the mortgage broker office and I have no idea what everyone's doing. Um, so thank you for sharing that because it kind of tells people, oh, that's the point guard. Oh, that's the center. Oh, that's the forward, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, very cool. And then you had also shared that if you needed to, you could also speed up the process. And I think... You know, you went back, uh, going back earlier, you shared that um, somebody couldn't get financed, they recommended that they talk to you, mm -hmm. and you were able to get this person closed in eight days. That's probably a situation where someone's financing doesn't actually happen, and now they're under contract, their earnest money is non-refundable, they don't want to lose it, and now something, somebody needs to come save the day. What are things that you can do to, in case somebody's listening, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's my situation right now. Um, what can you do to help somebody in this situation be able to take that process and make it quicker? So that's a good question, and I've done that a lot uh, over the last 10 years anyway, Okay. Um, as far as helping somebody speed up a process because one loan officer couldn't get it done or the pre-approval wasn't good. Um, one of the first things I do when I tell somebody, look, you've got a deadline approaching, one of the things as a real estate agent that you hate mm -hmm. is when a loan officer calls you, and I love to communicate with my real estate agents, and say, um, hey, I need to extend the financing and appraisal deadline, which is one of the deadlines on the contract. Right? Yes. You're going to go, what for? Right. Now I've got to talk to the seller's agent. It's going to maybe they're neurotic. I don't know what's going on over there, right? Yep. So you hate getting that call. So if I know um, that we're approaching deadlines, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, alert my borrower, right, and the realtor. We're going to double team. But if the borrower, if a realtor comes to me and says, Marcus, we are in a competitive situation, uh, we've got to close this in 14 days, 
I'm going to go to the borrower's house that night, yeah. or they're going to come to my office that night. We are going to get the documents that <clears throat> night. We are going to pull credit immediately. We are going to go right in. The due diligence now is out the window, right? Yeah, Basically. yeah, yeah. Um, and I tell the borrower up front, again, it's all about expectations. I tell them that I'm going to put a rush on the appraisal. It's generally $125, $150. Um, that they pay for. I get an appraisal back in 24 hours. That cuts off seven days right there. Um, if I alert um, the processor and the lender that I'm going to that we are doing as, as much of a rush as we can, mm -hmm. everybody's on board to get it done. Because what you don't want to do as a lender is when somebody's pushed for time to get something done on a contract, you want to save face as a lender and you want to perform. You want to get it done on that contract. The last thing you want to do is go to the realtor and say, you know, I can't get this done in your time frame. If it's three days, I mean, be real. Nobody's going to sure, get that done. Sure. Right? But if it's within a realistic amount of time and the lender can get it done if they jump through hoops, yep. you want to do it because you're going to make that borrower happy, the realtor happy on both ends, and you get raving fans for life. And, I mean, that's what we're in it for, right? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Very cool. Wonderful. Well, we're going to go to a commercial break again, uh, but uh, this will be a different type of commercial. Uh, Mohammed, if you don't mind taking us to commercial break with the fun little music. All right, Marcus, this commercial break, I am promoting a sushi restaurant. Oh my gosh. Yes, called Makisu. And it's on 777, 77, okay, hold on. 7777 State Street. Four sevens, <laughs> not seven sevens. I said seven, seven times. <laughs> It's four sevens, 7777 State Street. It's uh, really good food, really good um, sushi, and uh, I've become really good friends with them since they opened up. I, me and my wife decided to give it a shot, and we went in there, and they've taken such good care of us that I wanted to promote Makisu. So if you live in the Midvale, Murray, Sandy area, and you're looking for some good sushi, by a little mom and pop family, it's actually uh, two cousins that started it up. Um, I highly recommend going and checking it out. So it's 7777 State Street, Makisu, Google it. Um, tell them that Yoshi sent you. I've gotten to know them pretty well. All right, thank you, Mohammed. All right, those guys are really cool over there. I wanted to promote them. Um, and um, now we're gonna talk about refinancing. You know, I get asked a lot by clients should I refinance? And the answer is it depends. It depends on your situation, depends on a lot of things. We could probably talk about refinancing for hours. For an hour at least. <laughs> it's another show. Yeah, yeah. But if you don't mind, um, just giving everybody a brief idea on when refinancing, or maybe even a home equity line of credit might be a good idea. Again, this, this has everything to do with a conversation. If somebody, generally it's not me reaching out to people asking them if they want to refinance. Generally it's people reaching out to me. Um, although I do call people and they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm, let's talk about refinancing. Um, are you looking to, if you have a conventional loan, are you looking to refinance because you want to move your mortgage, remove your mortgage insurance? Mm -hmm. The first thing I want to tell you, if any lender ever calls you and says, hey, let's, uh, let's refinance to re remove your mortgage insurance, and let's say you're four years into your loan, Yep. don't refinance. Because after five years, you can petition the lender to remove your mortgage insurance on as long as you have a 78% loan to value. And that process goes through. The lender will order an appraisal. Um, they'll basically look at the equity in your property, what it's worth. And if you are under 78% loan to value, it's a two or three or $400 fee to remove the mortgage insurance instead of refinancing and costing three or $4,000. Um, so that's Got one it. aspect. Um, people are refinancing in droves right now, pulling money. I mean, you have equity. The equity growth in this state has been phenomenal. Absolutely. And I tell people all the time if they ask if it's a good idea, and I said, well, let's. is it for you? What do you want to do? Um, do you want to pay off a gentleman refinanced and paid off $1,100 in bills? His payment went up $108. Mm -hmm. So he has a, a net of what, $990 basically? Sure. To him, that was good. Resetting the clock 30 years, he didn't care. He wanted to get rid of that money. Um, but it just depends. People want to use that equity because let's face it, if there's a 30% drop in value tomorrow, that money's not there anymore. Right. It's paper money, it's there. And if there's something that you feel that you need to do, send a child to college, um, get a pull out some money to uh, help your son or your daughter or your son-in-law uh, buy a home 
uh, even an investment property, putting three and a half percent down and having them live in that to get them out of your hair, yep. um, that's one of the things you can do, right? Right. I've actually had clients tell me I'm pulling money out to help my brother and my sister buy a house because I don't want them living with me no more. I'm sick of them. <laughs> right. So it just depends on what your why is. Why do you want the money? Right. And if you're going to live in your house for another year or two uh, and sell it, well, again, let's weigh the option of refinancing, pulling money out. And home equity line is kind of the same thing. Um, I do notice, and I tell this to people a lot, a home equity line, a lot of times, you're going to pay 5% or more, even with an 800 FICO score, unless you've got a teaser rate for six months. But at 5% right now, rates, um, I mean, we're talking mid threes. So Amazing. why not use the cheaper money yeah. on your primary <clears throat> residence instead of paying 5% interest only on a home equity line of credit? But so in some instances, that makes sense. Yep. If you only want ten or $20,000, hey, go with a HELOC or a home equity line of credit. If you're trying to pull out a hundred grand to pay off debt, uh, purchase an investment property, whatever, let's use the cheap money if that's smart. Awesome, excellent. Marcus, we have chatted about obtaining a loan, we've chatted about refinancing just now, we've chatted about home equity line of credits. Um, who do you typically work with? Somebody who's listening right now goes, I think I want to work with Marcus Burton, but I wonder if he would do something like this. So just so listeners know, awesome. who do you typically work with? So when I first entered the business uh, 16 years ago as a new loan officer, I cut my teeth on working with people buying investment properties who had sometimes uh, 8, 10, 11 properties. That was the hardest way to cut your teeth as a loan officer. I found myself many times uh, at night looking at the condition sheets that I would get under my desk in the embryo position crying <laughs> because it was I was afraid of all the conditions. It was a huge thing to cut my teeth on. Yeah. But I think from that hard uh, situation that I was in, from the challenge, uh, it taught me right from the beginning anything else is gravy. Um, I'm, I'm, since I've owned investment properties, I've flipped homes as well. Um, I, I can do anything. I can help people get into a one to four unit, um, whether they uh, investment 20% down or whether it's an owner occupied 3.5% down using an FHA loan. Uh, I can do refinances, streamline refinances, VA. Uh, I love VA borrowers, 100% financing. Um, FHA, conventional, anything that you can think of that has to do with the house, I can pretty much do the financing. And I always tell my clients, if I can't, I will get somebody who can. I'm not one of those loan officers that if you can't do the deal, you're not going to give it to another loan officer who can. Got uh, it. That's just the way it's, it's karma to me. And I Wonderful. like to make sure they get the client yeah. gets what they need. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, guys, you have been listening to the show, Utah Home Sweet Home on KTOP Radio. I have my guest here, Marcus Burton. If you've missed any of this and you want to hear it, you can go to www.utahhomesweethome.com. You can also reach out to me with any questions that you might have in regards to today's show at 801-810-4475. And you can also visit YS, or you can also email me at YS at Utah Home Sweet Home, which is YS is in Yoshi Shiraki. Marcus, where can people reach you? You know what, they can call me on my cell or text me. I'm open, I'm not a credit union. I don't close my doors at five o'clock. I'm available on Saturdays, uh, sometimes Sundays, 801-915-1940. Uh, 801-915-1940. They can also go to Marcus Burton, the mortgage guy, uh, on Facebook. There's testimonials on there. There's things that sometimes I post on there that I think are relevant. Um, they can also email me at Marcus B, M A R C U S B, at innovativerates.com. Marcus B, at innovativerates.com. Marcus, thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom with our listeners. I hope you guys enjoyed it. K Talk Radio, Utah Home Sweet Home. I'm your host, Yoshi Shiraki, and until next week, thank you, Muhammad.